Welcome to Perspectives El Paso. I'm Leon Blevins of El Paso Community College Television. As you know, I start a lot of the programs with a story. Now this one may be a little longer than usual because this is the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. Within the National Park Service are national monuments and other locations. And we have one right here in El Paso called the Shamazal National Memorial. I have a 50 year connection at least to that location before they built a building there, before they built an outdoor stage, an amphitheater, any of those things. Because I was doing a master's thesis at Texas Western, became UTEP, and in 1966, I remember quite vividly, that uh, Lyndon Johnson took steps to do something to really finalize a boundary dispute between the United States and Mexico. Earlier, John F. Kennedy had started to move toward a treaty to deal with that, and the dispute over the land either side of the river. And so I was teaching there at that time and followed the story. But as it turned out, I had several student friends in classes. Two of them worked with Jonathan Cunningham, the director of, uh, of the planning department in El Paso. And they were interning or something there. And they were telling me about what they were working on. They were working on things about the Shamazal, an area known as Cordova Island also. And then one of the fellows in class, he was a lawyer, I believe, with the State Department, had been sent here. He was a brand new lawyer. And he came to work on eminent domain issues of moving people off of that area in order to make a property exchange between Mexico and the United States. I was gone for a few years, came back uh, to teach at community college and uh, teaching at UTEP also. And I discovered that uh, some of these people were still around that I'd met earlier in the planning stages. One of them named Frank Smith was the first director of Shamazal Memorial National Monument. He hired a young man to work with him, a young adult, and uh, uh, Don Middleton, I remember his name. I was in drama for a while and Don was in neurodrama. And so I did some volunteer work with them. They started something called the Border Folk Festival bringing in all kinds of dance and music and other programs that I loved greatly. Eventually I became a dance performer and performed down on those, some of those stages inside and outside as, as a, a hippie, flower child hippie with the Beatles band playing for music under the stars, uh, performing as uh, uh, Santa Claus and my wife sometimes with me as Mrs. Claus and we performed on, inside on the stage and some of her students and, and some of our, two of our granddaughters performed with us. And then the last one I'll mention was sometimes I performed as a greeter dressed as Chopin, the famous musician for the Chopin Music Festivals. That spans from 1966 to 2016. Here we are in the last day of uh, November of 2016. That's a long time. That's half the lifetime of the National Park Service that this Shamazal Memorial has been helping us to provide entertainment and education for the people of this area and from around the world that will come and see what we have. That's the reason important that today I have the current director, he hasn't been here very long with the Shamazal, but he, he goes by the name of Gus Sanchez. Gus, Gosh, welcome to the program. Did Thank I just you so fill much. you in on some history? <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> you <laughs> I did. Could, I could tell you a lot more if we had the time, but we want to give you time to to talk about your jewel right here, the gem on the border, Shamazal National Memorial. Now, when did you come here and from where did you come to serve at this location? Uh, I came uh, to Shamazal from uh, Lyndon B. Johnson National Historical Park. Oh, I love that one. Yeah, in uh, June 2013. And uh, uh, although I grew up on the U.S.-Mexican border in the Rio Grande Valley, mm -hmm. I uh, and uh, I have to confess, I'm actually a biologist by education. <laughs> uh, I love history, uh -huh. and so I have. I feel like I have advanced knowledge of the history of the U.S. and Mexico, and uh, and um, many aspects of of U.S. history. Uh, but uh, this story intrigued me with all the advanced uh, research that I did about the LBJ era and Johnson's connection to Chamizal. Uh -huh. uh, this seemed like a natural posting for me. You saw mm -hmm. different flora and fauna as you went to other locations. Just name a few of the other locations you served. Well, I, I started my career at Big Bend National Park here in the Chihuahuan Desert. Mm -hmm. uh, loved it. I still I love it still. Right. Um, <clears throat> but also served uh, as a seasonal ranger at uh, Sequoia Kings Canyon in California. Been there many times. Yes. Uh huh. 
uh, later worked at uh, Yosemite National Park. Wow. Uh, you know, certainly going there was a huge experience, you know, right. John Muir and all the rest. Right. And then, um, and one of the last assignments I, besides uh, Lyndon Johnson was, uh, I served as the acting superintendent of Little Bighorn Battlefield in Montana, the National Monument. You had an interesting education. Yeah, <laughs> sure no did. About Up front, real life sure. historical education sure. that you and, get. And the thing is that, um, this is what's so great about the National Park Service. You, no matter uh, how long you work, you never stop learning. And uh, that's one of the big benefits for us that have the privilege to serve in this agency. And we sh are so proud that we have a nation that is willing to protect historical and natural wonders. And people from come all over the world to come to Grand Canyon and other places to see sure. what we have here. Sure, I remember a meeting with a uh, a college professor from Ireland who I met at uh, Little Bighorn Battlefield mm -hmm. and he had been planning to come there for over 40 years wow. and finally made the trip and so I got to spend some time with him on the battlefield and he was uh, just thrilled. It was the uh, opportunity of a he lifetime. saw the sparkles in his eyes. Yeah, sure <laughs> did. <laughs> sure did. It's hard to, to miss that. You feel the energy of the historic site. You, mm -hmm. can, you can not just imagine what happened there but you can still feel it. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's amazing to have the chance to serve there. So over the years, I've had some of my students from Community College in UTEP that have worked there with you and your staff before you even arrived. Tell us about your size of your staff and obligations and duties of your staff. I've actually watched them at work as I've been on the stage. Sure, sure. No, well, we have uh, a, uh, an operation uh, nowadays. Uh, we have about uh, 20 permanent employees uh, supplemented with interns and some uh, seasonal employees as well. Um, we have several uh, ongoing operations that are part of the of all the national park sites. Right. Now one of the Chamizal is a very unusual park because it came was created during the time of uh, the Johnson administration, the Great Society mm -hmm. and that was a period in Park Service history when we were creating new types of urban parks. The idea of that administration being that National parks didn't just need to be uh, large natural sites far away from populations, mm -hmm. but that people in big cities would have the opportunity to enjoy and, and learn from national parks close by. So the, the park being a memorial to the Chamizal Treaty, a very significant part of not just U.S., but U.S.-Mexico history, uh, and really a worldwide symbol that uh, even a long conflict can be settled through diplomacy and working together. So it was a very significant uh, event historically. Uh, but uh, the, so the Chamizal is uh, in fact then really a historical park, okay? But they decided to do something unusual in not necessarily building a monument to the event but uh, building instead the Performing Arts right. Theater. That's what I like. Yeah, and uh, the, our mission becomes then that we're going to tell the story of Chamizal and all of the connected stories, the stories of Mexico, the stories of, of, the, of the history of Mexico, of Mexican Americans, all of it becomes part of the, what helped to create Chamizal. Uh, Mexican American civil rights, for example, right. or uh, military service. So. All of those things are connected and uh, it's a tall order to do that, uh, to try to communicate history through the arts and yet we take on that challenge all the time. So besides uh, our educational initiatives with the public and our interpretive uh, uh, operations with the public trying to teach them the history of the site, we also have as part of our staff, a, uh, the staff of the Performing Arts Theater so in the entire National Park Service, uh, I'm the only superintendent who had to learn about running a, a theater. <laughs> <laughs> but once, as I said, you never stop learning. That's right. Uh, but I'm very fortunate. I have some uh, really incredible people, including some who were uh, students, you know, mm -hmm. from uh, UTEP and EPCC who, who interned at the park, learned the techniques of uh, sound or lighting and managing the stage, right. uh, and all of the details necessary there. 
and then uh, have become permanent members of the park staff. So you can see the generations of people that have uh, gun, uh, actually performed at Chamizal and have worked there. Remember this show, for example, it's not just me, it's the crew out there putting it together, mm -hmm. doing the editing and things like that. At the Shamazal, I'm backstage preparing to go on stage, and I see these workers back there with the curtains and the lights and the sound and all the checks that we're mm -hmm. doing to make sure that it goes well. Sure. And the same with the, sh with the Chopin Music Festival, make sure that piano is tuned and they roll it out on time and put it in the right space and have the spotlight exactly the way that it should be. The little details that the public doesn't think about, but you, and your staff think about it. And I think I, I have to say, you know, uh, like a lot of things in life, you may understand the idea intellectually, mm -hmm. but it's not until you actually see it in action that you get a real appreciation for what it really takes to make that happen. Right now, of course, uh, annually, we uh, people are very aware of the Siglo de Oro Drama Festival. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be having that again this uh, coming April. Uh, and. Uh, and uh, so that's a, a program. In fact, it's the longest running um, festival of that particular art form in the world. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually recognized worldwide and most people don't expect to find that in El Paso, Texas. <laughs> uh, but uh, we also uh, have a very uh, successful education program now where not only are, am I sending uh, interpretive rangers out to the schools to teach uh, the story of Chamizal and all the related stories, but also we're doing programs where we bring them uh, to the park, to the theater, to try to, to interpret some of the themes that are really important. So for example, uh, recently, this last year, we had, uh, uh, you know, the, the theater's almost 500 seats, mm -hmm. and so we were able to fill that theater, and we had several performances of some of the Luis Valdez plays uh, having to do with Chicano theater and which actually deal with some of the uh, issues of uh, Mexican-American civil rights and so forth or even the life of being Mexican-American growing up in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so we had a uh, uh, presentation of a play called Los Vendidos. Uh, the play challenges the stereotypes of what it means to be Mexican-American or Mexican uh, very entertaining, but you could really see the students uh, starting to think, I'm Mexican-American, I live in El Paso, what does that mean for myself as long as, and how do people perceive me in the, in the general population? And many and of those students had never been in that theater, never been in that building. Never had been in the building. They might have been out there at the park sometime, but right. never in the building. Yeah, and that's what we want, what we want to do is we want to expand people's understandings of this very important part of history. I mean, the basic story of Chamizal that's the most significant is that we, uh, the two nations, found a way to settle this incredible conflict of almost 100 years, like I said, without having to go to war. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't mean that it didn't, it didn't hurt, mm -hmm. but it's like all of real life, you know, there's some pain and there's some positive things that come from it. And, and that's one aspect of Chamizal that I think people f kind of forget about. Right. Along with the settlement of the treaty and the channelization of the river so it wouldn't shift and the land swap, they also did things like uh, not only build uh, Chamizal National Memorial and its sister park in Mexico, El Parque de Chamizal, which provide education and recreational opportunities and, and hopefully a connection to that very important part of history. And when you start a lot of your programs, you show a video, a little short film. We're hoping we can pull maybe a little clip of that and show it during this program. Sure. And so that gives us some information about it. Yeah, what we're trying to do is trying to tell a very complex story right. in a, and dilute it to just a, a short period of time. But we are also doing uh, some new things now. Another annual event that we just started this last, uh, or this fall, is we're bringing back a, a version of the uh, Border Folk Festival, which later evolved into something called Chamizal Festival. Mm -hmm. And um, this October, uh, just last month, we were able to bring that back after m uh, many years of hiatus. I have missed it. Yes. Uh -huh. I have missed it. But we'll have it again next year. And we're trying to not only include the art and the culture, but also uh, 
focus a lot on uh, cultural demonstrations to show all of the elements of the different cultures that make up the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, you know, one of the things I've learned uh, as growing up along the U.S.-Mexico border and then serving a lot of my adult life on it, I mean, I, I was at Big Bend for uh, 12 years along a very remote but important part of the U.S.-Mexico border and, uh, and then these uh, three years I've been here at Chamizal. Um, is that I, I've, I've learned this long ago, you know, uh, the issues that affect the U.S.-Mexico border, I see people discussing them on a national level, uh, immigration, for example. But uh, it's ne your understanding, like I said before, is never the same until you actually come here. And there are different right? things happening and attitudes in different parts of this very long border. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's, you know, people are not, you know, all one perspective. Mm -hmm regardless of, uh, of where, what your cultural background is or what your experiences are. And so uh, that's one of the fascinating things to me about the border is instead of just focusing as uh, often will happen in the media, it becomes the negative, so-called negative right. news about it, is think of all the positive things. You know, when I see all of the commerce that's going back and forth across this border, and being right next to the bridge of the Americas, I see the effect of that firsthand. Oh, yeah. In fact, sometimes I have trouble leaving work because I can't get out. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lucy Scarborough that I work with with the Chopin Music Festival, she's had it at your location for the last several years, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. <coughs> and then Shakespeare on the Rocks, I've worked mm -hmm. with Hector Serrano and David Mills on mm -hmm. that in various roles, and even as Shakespeare, dressed as Shakespeare. And so you've had that. Uh, brought back to the Shamazal. And exactly. I've, I did an interview on this program just recently about one of their programs in Shakespeare on the Rocks. I love all of this. Yes, uh -huh. it, it's really important. Like I said, uh, our role as, a, uh, as being an important part of the community and being able to provide a venue for these uh, efforts uh, that l people have been involved with for many, many years is really a special one. And so we're, we're happy to be able to serve in that capacity. You also have some art exhibits. We need to let people know about that. Sure. In fact, right now, uh, our gallery, uh, you mentioned uh, Frank Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, our gallery is now named the Franklin G. Smith Gallery. Right. Okay. And uh, right now we have an exhibit uh, that's called La Revolucion. Uh, Carlos Flores, uh, who is a local El Paso artist. In fact, he's the artist that painted the mural on the building itself, uh, but in which was recently restored once again. He, also, he had an exhibit of uh, paintings uh, depicting the Mexican Revolution. And just to give you an example of using art to tell history, we have the art, uh, incredible paintings, uh, and then we combine that with uh, some uh, historical quotes by some of the revolutionary leaders and, uh, from Mexico and uh, people have gone through the exhibit, enjoyed the art, and say, you know, now that I see it in this context, I understand a little more what this revolution was mm -hmm. about. And so it's, it's tough, it's subtle, but it also can be very effective in connecting people to the significance of history. And so, yeah, El, El, El Paso, you know, uh, really is an incredible community. And, um, and of course, as I've learned years ago, even working at a park like Big Bend on the border, you know, when it comes to nature, that boundary, the international boundary is a legal one, but it's an imaginary one. Wow. Nature doesn't recognize that boundary. And culture doesn't always recognize that And culture that doesn't recognize <laughs> it either. And, and in fact, uh, uh, economics in many, in yes, many ways doesn't exactly. recognize Those it. Those big trucks right. going back and That's forth. That's right. Yeah. There's another aspect I want to mention. Sometimes uh, uh, roving exhibits, an exhibit comes through. Mm -hmm. I bought this in your gift shop a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one of two copies that we know of, of the Treaty of Alasco, mm -hmm. about uh, an attempt to end the war with uh, Santa Ana and Sam Houston, a Texas Revolution yes. period. Mm -hmm. And so this has a little bit of that story uh, about that. And so I saw that exhibit. And I remember seeing another exhibit about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo ending the Mexican-American War. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if that was the original document on display or a facsimile of it. It was a facsimile. But That's what uh, I thought, a facsimile of mm -hmm. that. So that t these are also teaching tools. If you can get people to go back there and look at them. Sure. Or they're advertised in the newspaper on TV that right. they're here. 
Yeah, and I mean, that's part of it. And our, part of our intention is not only to uh, have uh, art, you know, uh, theatrical presentations, but we're also using our theater now to uh, host a lot of uh, historical talks and events, mm -hmm. uh, documentaries, for example, uh, that we're able to use uh, all as tools to help tell the many facets of this important historical story. I was there uh, dressed as um, Uncle Sam when Kim, Ken Burns came. He was doing a series about the national parks mm -hmm. for documentary television programs. And it was a treat to get to visit with him a little bit and get a, a picture made with him. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you have people like that that come in and present for you. Yeah, yeah, we sure do. And uh, and then I, I think a lot of people may have forgotten, but uh, uh, in fact, President Barack Obama visited the park in 2011 when he came uh, to our site. And uh, I wasn't there yet, but I've seen the video and he came to present a talk on the uh, initiative to create a new immigration bill mm -hmm. in 2011. Uh, so that becomes part of the historical. I got a call from fabric. a female reporter from Channel 4 News, television news, mm -hmm. and said, could you, could I come to your office and interview about the Shamazal, why Obama's coming to the Shamazal? I said, I'll meet you at the Shamazal. I'll meet you in front of the theater and we'll have a backdrop there. And so she interviewed me there about why the Shamazal, why was Obama coming here? And so I went over a little bit of what you just mentioned there mm -hmm. about the significance of this with regarding a peaceful settlement between two nations. You know, wars have been started on less than 50 acres of land. That's right. That's and right. this 50 acres of land approximately was able to be settled peacefully without a war. Yeah, and I think, I think that that's, you know, I, I, I mentioned I, I served at Little Bighorn Battlefield and, and, and uh, believe me, some of the battlefield sites that I've been to uh, as I was mentioning, you can still feel what happened there. Mm -hmm. And we're often uh, uh, certainly impacted by war, but uh, shouldn't we be impacted by peace and diplomacy as mm -hmm. well? I mean, that's uh, a real achievement for, for nations. And so I, I don't believe that that could have happened the way it had if it hadn't been for the foresight of of the people acting on our behalf at that time. And also President Kennedy, President Mateos, uh, followed by Lyndon Johnson. And that and so involved forth. diplomacy. Yes. These were public officials mm -hmm. acting in gentlemanly, diplomatic ways mm -hmm. to see if they could resolve a problem. Mm -hmm. And they were able to do it. Yes. And here you are a part of that legacy. Yeah. So it's amazing. It's amazing <laughs> to to be able to, to do that. I, I think about the feeling uh, you know, when I was growing up, uh, I was, uh, I guess I was five years old when uh, LBJ became the president. Everybody remembers that day he was alive. Oh my goodness. Where they were. I and was already teaching in yeah. high school and college then. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, uh, but so because of that, of my age at that time, um, my father was, uh, he didn't get to have a college education, but he was very engaged in history in the United States and our government. And so I uh, looked up to him and I, I was interested. And so, but for me personally, when I thought of the word president, I thought of Lyndon Johnson. Because mm -hmm. that, that event, the, the assassination of President Kennedy, woke me up mm -hmm. as a child to what, what, how important it was. Mm -hmm. And so I always thought of LBJ that way. And then I thought, well, you know, at, as a kid, I never dreamed from South Texas that I would get to be the superintendent or the chief ranger at uh, Lyndon B. Johnson National <laughs> Historical <laughs> Park and actually be where the president made decisions and, and, wow. uh, and feel the energy of those historic places. And then of course, you know, that's like I said, that's the amazing thing about working for the national parks that after that I would get to serve as the superintendent of Chamizal. Give us a telephone number or website if you wish to about location. Yes, uh, what uh, people should visit is uh, www.nps, like National Park Service, mm -hmm. dot gov slash uh, c-h-a-m for Chamizal. Okay. And that'll take you straight to our website. You can learn a lot more about this very important part of history and also about all the programs that we have ongoing here at our, our National Memorial. Do you know that there are probably some people listening to this? We have a small audience, but they're a highly selective audience that we have. Mm -hmm. 
information and education and um, some of them probably inspired. Don't you have some people come up and say, how can I get into this? How could I become a park ranger? Sure, it, it happens all the time. Uh, in fact, uh, during my career, I've been approached by, uh, I've, over the years, doing programs in different parks or speaking to the public. I've had men come to me and they said, you know, he said, I've been very successful in my life financially. I'm, I'm wealthy. Uh, but they say, you know, just between you and me, what I always wanted to do was I wanted to be a park ranger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I found that to be kind of uh, sobering because uh, I, I, I realized the importance of what we're doing, uh, not only today, but in the long run for this very American ideal, uh, the national park idea that has actually spread to countries all over the world. And uh, we're, I'm proud to be part of that. And I think it's a real important legacy that America has given to the world. And so, so I'd say, well, maybe I don't have as much money as those guys, but I got to do something they always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just been a great ride. Yeah. Just a couple of weeks ago, I, along with a number of others, testified about Kasner Range, mm -hmm. asking President Obama to act quickly to see about preserving that because of its historical value, because of its ecological value and things like this. And you've seen this happening all over the country where you've been involved with National Park Service. Sure, sure. And I, and I, I want to remind people that uh, the way that uh, all of, there's different legal uh, mechanisms that are used to protect a site, uh, the National Park Service being a, a very special one, right. an important one. But it's, I, I encourage everyone that when you really believe in something, you should put your energy towards it. Work with the system because uh, that's exactly how the National Park Service was started in the first place. It wasn't necessarily some high-powered uh, people or politicians who said, let's do this. It was uh, individuals understanding the significance of these places and moving forward and you know uh, the history of the U.S. and even our system is complex, right. and we're still living it today. <laughs> uh, but uh, the that's something amazing to me that out of all the confusion and sometimes conflict in the U.S. system, that we were able to realize such an incredible uh, ideal and uh, professionalize and protect very important places. And so that's the other uh, thing I've learned. You know, there are some parks that I'll probably never get to visit. Uh, and then there's parks out there, sites, historic sites, that uh, some people will never go to. They, but all need, they all need to be preserved and right. protected, and that's the problem. It's not right. enough to designate a place as a park, mm -hmm. but you have to put some money into it, some time, expertise, training mm -hmm. of the people such as you. Yeah. to participate. Well, our time is gone, my goodness. Wow. It's so great, Gus, to, yes. to meet you. I've seen you down there but just for the last several months or so. Mm -hmm. So thanks for being on the show with Thank me. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. And sharing with us. I know that you have inspired some others that they're going to go out and find a job with the National Park Service. Okay, <laughs> sounds great. Thank <laughs> okay. you so much. Thanks for watching again an interesting program we call Perspectives El Paso. Tune in for future shows. <laughs>